Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. I remember being a kid and I, my favorite hero was Superman. Like I love Superman so much that how many, how many group like around the 80s? Any 80s people out there? Well, I remember taking my mom's towels and I would make capes out of them. Y'all, did y'all ever do that? And man, I would go and, and I would draw on the towel and, and then go out and play with all my friends. But then I'd get bored and I would take off my cape, drop it on the ground, and I started playing with my friends. But then I'd forget the towel and I'd get in so much trouble because, man, before you knew it, we had no more towels. And my mom was like, what is wrong with you, kid? And, uh, and I would, you know, do all kinds of crazy stuff, fly off of things, jump off trees, hurt myself. But the Jesus I want to talk to you about today is not a fiction. We're talking about a Jesus who is more than a hero. He is beyond a hero. He's our savior. Jesus is someone that, that, that not only demonstrated his power, but he demonstrated with his power with great love by what he did on Calvary, by what he did on the cross. And when you think about the Jesus I'm speaking to you about, I'm talking to you about the Jesus who who cast out demons, the Jesus who walked on water. You look at all of his different function and power that he had, not only to, to do things like that, but he can look at storms and, and people were filled with terror and with simple words like peace be still, he was able to seize the winds and the waves. I'm talking to you about the Jesus who had the power to forgive prostitutes, embezzlers, liars, cheaters. I'm talking to you about the Jesus who had the power to heal people that were blind, people that were deaf, people that were paralyzed. I'm talking to you about a Jesus who stood at the front of a tomb of his good friend, and he called him friend named Lazarus, and with his unconditional power called love, he called out Lazarus from his tomb, and he said, Lazarus, come forth, and as Lazarus came out of that grave with his grave clothes, he said, take those clothes off of him. I don't know how you came in today. I don't know what kind of grave clothes you have on, what kind of stuff you have that's called sin that has been trying to separate you from the love and the grace and the mercy of God. But I believe that all day today, Jesus is saying to every single church in the world, come forth. And this is why we celebrate Easter. And I love the fact that we have stories like Marvel in D.C. Because you know what? There's so much to take out of that story. But when you read the Bible, it has every kind of genre you can think it has action adventure it has love it has terror it has horror it has everything you can think of hollywood does not have more imagination than the creator of all imagination amen he is so awesome and so as i was just preparing this message and and thinking about jesus and then thinking about my my, my childhood hero superman you know, I started realizing that there are some, some similarities to my superhero Jesus when I was a child, but also those that, 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 that claim to believe. Because here's the truth. In America, uh, they did a poll, and they say that 87% of people in the United States of America claim to be a Christian. 87%. Now, whether or not they are living for God is another story. And I say this because I want you to have ears to hear what I have to say today. That's why we did something comedic because, you know what, I want to soften the blow today. <laughs> Y'all ready? Yeah. And so when you begin to think about the similarities of, of Superman and then our, our walk of faith as a believer, let me show you. Look, number one, Superman is not of this world. A child of God is not of this world either. Guess what? You and I, we're made up of a soul and a spirit. And this soul does not live on this earth. This soul is going to go, hopefully, for those who truly believe in Jesus Christ, will be with, with, with God in heaven for eternity. Well, Superman also, he wasn't from here. 
You're not from here. Number two, look at this. Superman fights evil. Well, guess what? If you're someone that's a believer and that you have your faith and trust in God, well, you also are constantly fighting evil. It is a dark world that we live in, and the world is going to get darker, people. Please understand this. The world is going to get darker. Well, that's negative, pastor. What do you mean the world's going to get darker? Well, if you read your Bible, the end for this earth is destruction. But let me tell you some good news. But the world can get brighter through you and me. So while the world and the earth is getting darker, the church, the people that want to place their faith in Christ are getting brighter and their light is shining. And that, let me tell you something, that's pretty supernatural. Number three, Superman also draws his strength from the sun. However, we draw our strength from the sun and his name is Jesus. So do you see some of, some of the similarities here? The only problem that we have is this or the only problem Superman has an issue with or the only thing that can stop Superman is this beautiful little piece called what? Kryptonite. Kryptonite, Kryptonite was the only thing. I mean, I would look at Superman in my cartoon days and anytime Kryptonite came, I'm like, oh, here we go again. You would look at him and he would just begin to get this, he became like, like an average human or, or even weaker than the average human. And I remember seeing him always falling to the ground and crawling. And, and it was the only thing that can stop him from functioning the way he was designed to function. He was designed to function not only with, with, with strength and, and power and resilience, but, but he, also, he also had something that always tried to stop him called kryptonite. Well, you and I, we're no different. We have some similarities. You know why? Because you and I, we have some kryptonite too. It's called sin. And sin is always trying to stop you from ever coming to the complete and full knowledge of God. Sin is trying to stop your function on how God designed you to be on this earth. You weren't born by accident. You were born with an intention. You were born with a purpose. And Satan wants to keep you from that purpose purpose and ever coming to the understanding that there is more to life than just what I'm living on a daily basis with God. God has something amazing. Please, I pray that today that the veil would be removed for many of us, for many of us, because so many of us are just living life casually while there are casualties taking place. And we have to see the reality that there is something so heavy and so deep called sin that stops us from functioning the way God wants us to function. He wants us to function with peace and joy and strength. Not to say that you're not going to have challenges. Not to say that you're not going to have issues in family. Not to say that you're not going to have moments in life that are tragic. That all comes with life. But the difference is, is that once you have Christ in you, man, I'll tell you, life can be overcoming by faith. It can. It can't. So there are some similarities there with Superman and the person who we call a man or woman of faith. Let me give you a definition of kryptonite. Check this out. Kryptonite is a fictional. Say fictional. fictional. So I don't want you to leave this place today and be like, oh, my God, that church. No, no, no. You're going to leave here today saying, wow, I didn't see it that way. But kryptonite is a fictional radioactive substance originally from his home planet. So kryptonite neutralizes Superman's abilities to function the way he was designed to function. Well, when you think about Satan, uh, he was the author of sin. And it started back in our home called heaven. And we know the story. Satan, you know what? He got very prideful, very arrogant. And he was, he was so jealous at the power of God that he started kind of doing things his way. He started kind of getting in with a group of people called angels. And he started having conversation and gossip and slander. And before you know it, Satan was able. Now, he was an angel of light. Before all this, he was the worship leader of heaven. 
And now he's getting all kinds of people from the worship team and the angels that show up to church every single Sunday. And he begins to tell them, hey, you know what, man? I bet if we did something together, we can do something so much more powerful than God can. You know what? He was so jealous at the fact that God, you know what, was all powerful. Because here's the truth. Satan has limited power, but God is unlimited powerful. Amen? That's the difference between Satan and God. And so God saw this and he said, man, what is wrong with you, fool? And Satan Satan convinced a third of the angels to go with him. That's no different than the church today. You see, so many times I hear people say, I can't believe God turned his back on us. No, let me tell you something. We have never, or God has never turned his back on you. We are the ones who turn our back on God. And Easter is a reminder. And it sucks that it only happens once a year. Easter should be an everyday celebration that we have power in the resurrected Jesus. Amen. And so we know that that's where it originated. Sin originated in our home. Well, kryptonite originated in Superman's home as well. But look at what Isaiah 60 verse 2 says. Look at this. It says, darkness covers the earth. And isn't that so true? I wish I had one of those deep voices, like those trailer movie deep voices. And, and I would read it like this, like dark covers the earth. <laughs> but check this out. Dark covers the earth. Thick darkness spreads over the nations. And I love God's butt because God's butt is so much greater than anything the devil's doing in your life right now. But he says, but I will rise and shine on you. My glory will appear over you. God is never going to give Satan the glory of anything that you experience in this life. He will never allow him to have the glory in any tragic situation in your life. He will never give the devil glory in any traumatic situation, any circumstance, challenge, problem. He will never. He says, but God, but God will shine his light over you. And the truth is this. You look at our world today. Just watch the news. It is so dark, but it's not just dark. It's thick in its darkness. And we have to come back to the reality that this sin is literally destroying the earth. This sin, you know, I've, I've asked people, Pastor, or they've asked me, Pastor, why, why is it that, that all these horrible things happen to good people? Why is it that even people that love God, why is it that they're going through what they're going through? Here's the truth and here's the reality. If you read your Bible, the Bible is very clear that that sin brings forth death. And there is so much sin in this world that it literally attracts destruction. And I love what John 10.10 10 says. He says, but I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. Yeah, though the enemy comes to steal, kill, destroy, Jesus says, but I give life. And God wants to give life to every single one of us, regardless of the kryptonite that we may be facing right now. Maybe there's some things that we're dealing with right now that you're not willing to admit to, okay? Because though Satan was the one who birthed sin, without even knowing sometimes, we can be so blinded by life that we're not walking in it. Let me give you a definition for sin now. Here's our kryptonite. Sin is an immoral act. Everybody say act. And I want you to understand this before you leave. It's an act. But there's a process to that act. So it's an immoral act to be a transgression against divine law, wrongdoing, an act of evil or wickedness. And it says transgression, crime, or offense. And when you read the scriptures and you read Isaiah, Isaiah begins to, to point to the Messiah, Jesus, the one who can can be the answer to our destruction. And he says in 59 verse 2 of Isaiah, he says, but your iniquities. Everybody say your iniquities. I remember reading my Bible when I was first like a young believer. I was like, what the heck is an iniquities? He says, but your iniquities and transgressions have separated you from your God. Do you understand that right now it just takes one degree to be far off from God? It just takes one degree. It's like the sun one degree off and man, we would all fry. One degree. And he says, it's, it's separated you from God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not listen. The problem is this. I think that if you're not careful, you think that God is a harsh God. No, it's not that he's a harsh God. 
God is a God of order. God is a God of divine boundary. And when you begin to think about what he is saying when he talks about iniquities, iniquities is simply this. I want you to look up on the screen. Iniquity is an inward motivation that drives you towards sin. And so here in the scripture, he's saying, hey, listen, but your iniquities, come on, your inward motivation that drives you to sin, sin starts in the heart, okay? It starts in the heart. He says it's these iniquities that separate you from God. You can be a very good Christian and be separated from God. Well, how is that possible? How can I possibly be separate? I believe in God. That's the problem. There are too many people that believe in God but don't act upon what they believe. That's the issue. We have too many believers and not many actors. God wants to activate what you believe. Are you hearing me today? Okay, so, so when he says this, he says, it's, it's not that I stop hearing from you. It's not that I don't want to listen to you, but you have allowed the iniquity, the, 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 the inward. Everybody say inward. Come on, iniquity is inward. You have allowed the inward parts of your heart to be driven and motivated by sin that my law, my, my divine nature does not connect with this style of lifestyle. This is not what I want. And so it separates us from God. But then he begins to talk about transgression. Transgression is the outward. Everybody say outward. Okay, so he talked about the inward, and then he says, but I, I also want to talk about the transgression. Transgression is the outward action of that iniquity. So it starts with the heart. You start thinking about things, right, things that you didn't think about before, like I would never steal, but all of a sudden the temptation of, of wanting to steal, you know, it may be from your company, the temptation of wanting to look at a woman or a man lustfully, that starts inwardly. It starts in the heart, and then eventually that sin begins to grow it begins to give birth to some things deeper things thicker things called darkness and then before you know it you act upon that why because what you believe becomes your behavior and so the apostle paul is looking at the church he's looking at the corinthians on easter sunday and he's talking to the Corinthians, and he's saying, hey, guys, we're missing it. Man, we are getting far off from God. What is wrong with us? And he has this passion, and he says to them, look at this. In 1 Corinthians 11.30, because the problem was that the people were turning their back from God's divine wisdom, and they preferred to embrace the wisdom of a temporary wisdom, which is the earth. And he says, that is why. Everybody say, that is why. Right here. Sin. He says, that is why many of you are weak and many of you are sick. That is why many of you are weak and many of you are sick. That is why a number of you have died. Now listen. Sin literally zaps your strength. You, you may not be physically dead, but I know that there are a lot of people in the church, outside the church, that are spiritually dead. There's no life. How is it that we can have a savior? How is it that we can have someone who was willing to give everything, his life, to be sacrificed on a cross, and we still choose? We still choose the motivations and the desires of our own sinful heart, knowing that there is one, and his name is Jesus, who crushed not only sin, but death, hell, and the grave. And he says, and so this is why. Everybody say, this is why. This is why you're weak. This is why you're sick. This is why you're weak. This is why you're sick. Sick, listen, sin brings forth death. It's a process. But it does come for you. And that's Satan's desire is for him to see us completely separated from God that we get to the place where we start blaming God. Isaiah 53 verse 5. Look at this. This is so awesome. He says, but he was wounded. Look at this. But here's the answer. But Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. What? He was wounded. He was wounded. Everything he experienced on that cross, he said, I did it for you. I was wounded for your actions. I was wounded for every single sin that you have literally desired out of your own little precious heart. 
When you were turning from me, from me, I still was willing to be wounded from your transgression. And look at this. And he was bruised. Look at that. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are what? The only antidote to your sin, my sin, is Jesus. There is no other way. There is no other way. You can't, you can't serve God on this earth enough. You can't feed enough homeless people on this earth. You can't do enough kind things on this earth and think that kindness and goodness will give you salvation. No, it's the shed blood of Jesus. It's our faith in the cross. It's us embracing what Christ did for us. And it's saying, I no longer want to live a dysfunctional lifestyle with this thing called kryptonite, right? I want to live for Jesus Christ with the power that brings resurrection in my life. That's the one that we live for. Amen? <laughs> So Jesus died, but he also, he rose again. Let's not forget that he, he was also raised from the dead. He didn't just die for your sins. He rose again. Why did he raise again? Why was he raised again? He was raised so that he can remove the sin from your heart. That's the whole purpose, to give us a find out foundational difference. Look at this. Here's the foundational difference. Put this up, guys. When you live for the world, stay with me. Because when you live for the world, you're going to get tainted with darkness. When you live for the world, this is what you say. I choose what is good, right, or best for me. Like, I know what's good for me. Don't tell, don't tell me what to do. There goes that pastor again talking about how I should live. It's none of his business. You're right. It is, it's none of my business. But when Jesus was willing to die for your business, <laughs> it's his business. The believer says, I choose what God says is good. I choose what's right. I choose what's best for me based on what God said for me. Are you hearing me today? That, that's the difference between someone who lives for the world. Look, James 1.22 says this, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. And let me tell you something, Easter Sunday, churches are packed packed like we're gonna have services today packed we'll probably have over 1500 people today it'll be packed but let me tell you something but you got too many hearers and you're not doers means God wants you to go into action this simply means in this verse that if you're just hearing the word of God but you fail to act upon it he's saying you're deceiving yourself you're deceiving yourself you know what at that point it's not even the devil's fault it's your fault. You're, you're choosing to say, okay, great. I hear what you're saying, but you walk out and you do the same thing. The proof that we believe something isn't when we agree with the person teaching us this. The proof, come on, the proof is when we hear what's being taught and we act upon it. That's the proof that we then truly believe. Daniel 11.32 says this, but the people who know their God that's what God wants this Easter. He wants you and him to know each other personally, intimately, not religiously. Come on, we're not gathering for a religious event here today. We're gathering because we want an intimate, genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Listen, God, God didn't just rescue you for you to be comfortable God rescued you to rescue others. God saved you so that you in return can save others. We have the best. Listen, Hollywood does not have this message. God has the greatest message on planet Earth. And 2,000 years later, it's still the number one bestseller. It's the Holy Bible. All over the world, people are coming to Jesus. I end with this. On Calvary Day, we always talk about the one cross. We talk about our Savior. And that's awesome. That's what it's all about. But let me just kind of throw something out there for you. On that day, there was three crosses, if you read your Bible. There was a guy on the left, and there was a guy on the right. And then we have Christ who was in the center. 
And each one of them were exactly 10 feet away from Jesus. Both of them, 10 feet away. These two guys had similar lifestyles. They were criminals. They were guilty. The death that they were about to have and experience on the cross was one that was filled with shame, guilt, and condemnation. They deserved that death. They, they deserved everything that was coming to them. But there's a problem here because you know what? When you read the Bible about the guy on the left, the guy on the left was so bitter, so resentful, so angry. And I'm sure because you know what? Through life, he probably experienced all kinds of drama, all kinds of pain, all kinds of trauma as well. I'm sure that his lifestyle was probably not one that he chose, but because he was in a world filled with thick darkness, he just kind of got just slipped into it. And on this day, you would think that he would have fear, a fear of God. But you know what this guy in the left starts doing? He starts cursing God. He starts cursing Jesus. He says, man, if you're the Messiah and everything you say you are, why don't you get us off, man? Let's get out of here and let's roll out of this place. And he's mocking Jesus. But here's the cool thing. The guy on the right, as you read the Bible, the guy on the right is just shaking his head and he's just weeping because he's realizing the fact that he deserves this death. See, he came to a place where he looked at the guy that was talking on this cross. And I'm just going to call this cross the cross of rebellion. And the cross of rebellion was so impactful to the guy that's on the right cross that he says to him, what is wrong with you? That man that you're cursing, he doesn't deserve this death. He's innocent. What we did, we deserve it. He doesn't deserve any of this. So he stands up for righteousness. So we'll call this cross the cross of repentance. See, you can be 10 feet away from God and completely miss that you have the cross of redemption. God wants to redeem you from your sins. Sometimes you have to go so far left in order to go right again. Sometimes you have to be that. Sometimes you life, life has just thrown you so left that you finally come to the right mind and you realize that on Easter Sunday, my God, I am just feet away from my Savior who wants to forgive me, who wants to love me, who wants to embrace me, who wants to forgive me of all my sins yesterday, today's, and tomorrow. We have a Savior who wants to love you. As a matter of fact, let me tell you something. When the man on the right stood up for Jesus, he said to him, Jesus... Please remember me when I die. Please remember, remember me. And because of the repentance that Jesus saw in this man, knowing that he was a criminal, knowing that he was a murderer, knowing that he did all wrong on this earth, Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. That's the love of Jesus Christ. That he'll take you at your worst point of life. He'll take you in the midst of your adultery. He'll take you in the midst of your embezzlement. He'll take you in the midst of your lying. He'll take you in the midst of your brokenness. He'll take you in the midst of whatever you've been through. And he's just looking for the cross of repentance. And when you have that cross of repentance, Jesus says, hey, listen, today you and I will be in paradise. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 39, and what can separate us from the love of God? Shall death, life, persecutions, famine, nothing can separate us from the love of God. I don't know where you're at with your walk with God. Maybe you're someone that grew up in the church. Maybe you're someone that goes to church, but you know what? But your life doesn't line up with his life. You can get it right today. Maybe you're someone that's never been to church. You're in church today, you're like, dang, they do like Marvel stuff up here? That's crazy, man. I've never seen a crazy church like them. That's okay. At the 8 a.m. service, people surrendered their life to Jesus. There's no shame in this place. There's no fear in this house. There's only love. And he covers the multitude of sins. But God wants to change your life. He's not just a hero. He's your Savior. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.